In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Peace be with you. Brothers and sisters, let us acknowledge our sins and so prepare ourselves to celebrate the sacred mysteries. I confess to Almighty God and to you, my brothers and sisters, that I have greatly sinned in my thoughts and in my words, in what I have done and what I have failed to do, through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault. Therefore I ask, Blessed Mary, ever Virgin, all the angels and saints, and you, my brothers and sisters, to pray for me to the Lord our God. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to life everlasting. Let us pray. O God, who out of the abundance of your untold grace alone, choose to set your servant and priest William over the church of Springfield this day. Grant that he may carry out worthily the office of bishop, and under your go governance in all things, he may direct by word and example the people entrusted to his care. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. A reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. The spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to bring good news to the afflicted, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, release to the prisoners, to announce a year of favor from the Lord and a day of vindication by our God, to comfort all who mourn, to place on those who mourn in Zion a diadem instead of ashes, to give them oil of gladness instead of mourning, a glorious mantle instead of a faint spirit. They will be called oaks of justice, the planting of the Lord to show his glory. The word of the Lord. Thank you. Thank you.
A reading from the first letter of St. Peter. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who in his great mercy gave us a new birth to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by the power of God are safeguarded through faith to a salvation that is ready to be revealed in the final time. In this you rejoice, although now for a little while you may have to suffer through various trials, so that the geniusness of your faith, more precious than the gold that is perishable, even though tested by fire, may prove to be for praise, glory, and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Although you have not seen him, you love him. Even though you do not see him now, yet believe in him, you rejoice with an indescribable and glorious joy as you attain the goal of faith, the salvation of your soul. The word of the Lord. My sisters and brothers, the Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. After Jesus had revealed himself to his disciples and eaten breakfast with them, he said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Simon Peter answered him, Yes, Lord you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my lambs. He then said to Simon Peter a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Simon Peter answered him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, Son of John, do you love me? Peter was distressed 
that he had said to him a third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Amen, amen, I say to you, when you were younger, you used to dress yourself and go where you wanted. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. He said this signifying by what kind of death he would glorify God. And when he had said this, he said to him, follow me. The Gospel of the Lord.
Most Reverend Father, the Church of Springfield asks you to ordain this priest, William Draper Byrne, to the responsibility of the Episcopate. Have you a mandate from the Apostolic See? We have. Let it be read. Your Eminences, Cardinal O'Malley, Cardinal Dolan, Cardinal Well, Cardinal Gregory, Your Excellency Archbishop Michael Rosansky, Your Excellency Bishop McManus, Your Excellency Bishop Emeritus Timothy McDonnell, my brother Archbishops and Bishops, dear priests, deacons, consecrated religious and lay faithful of the Diocese of Springfield in Massachusetts, dear friends, to each of you, warm greetings and peace in the holy season of Advent. In this Advent season of joyful expectation and on this memorial of St. John of the Cross, priest and doctor of the Church, who the sacred liturgy offers to us as a model of outstanding dedication to perfect self-denial and love of the Cross, the Reverend William Byrne, will be consecrated as a bishop and installed as the 10th bishop of the Diocese of Springfield in Massachusetts. Having distinguished himself as a gifted author, social media personality, so I am told that you are, <laughs> campus minister and missionary of mercy, the most important. On the first Sunday of Advent, Pope Francis preached Knowing that the hearts of this, his, his disciples were troubled, Jesus once more called the twelve and told them what was to happen to him. We have just heard it ourselves, the third announcement of his passion, death, and resurrection. This is the road taken by the Son of God, the road taken by the servant of the Lord, Jesus identifies himself with the, this road so much so that he himself is the road. I am the way. He says, this way and none other. Your Excellency, as you begin your Episcopal ministry and mission to the people of Springfield, stay on this road, the road of a servant, even if it is difficult, a difficult one at times. It is upon this road of the suffering servant that you will be more configured to Christ and lead your people to their destination, which is heaven itself. St. John of the Cross, whose feast we celebrate today, reminds us, in the dark night of the soul, bright flows the river of God. Bishop Elect Byrne, we thank you for accepting to call the call to serve as chief shepherd of this local church. We also publicly express our confidence that as you humbly yet insistently teach, govern, and sanctify in the example of one, the one good shepherd, you will be a prophet, witness, and servant of Christian hope for the flock entrusted to your pastoral care and also for the community at large. May the prayerful intercession of Our Lady of Mercy, St. John of the Cross, and St. Michael the Archangel, patron of this diocese, continually encourage you in your daily Episcopal ministry. At this time, I would like to thank Bishop Robert McManus, here present on my right side, for this for his service as Apostolic Administrator of the Diocese and Archbishop Rosensky, hidden behind, for his service as Ordinary of the Diocese until his transfer to St. Louis. And now it is my pleasure to read for you an English translation of the Apostolic Letter by which the Holy Father appointed His Excellency William Byrne as Bishop of the Diocese of Springfield. Francis, Bishop, Servant of the Servants of God. To our beloved son, William Draper Byrne, Jr., 
from the clergy of the Archdiocese of Washington, until now pastor of Our Lady of Mercy Parish in Potomac, appointed Bishop of Springfield in Massachusetts, greetings and apostolic blessing. As we humbly carry out our responsibility as Vicar of Christ, we try with steadfast charity to embrace lovingly all the faithful who have been entrusted to us by divine providence, assigning to them suitable men to execute the Episcopal office. Accordingly, at this time, we turn our attention to the pastoral needs of the community of Springfield in Massachusetts, which currently stands in need of its own lawful ordinary owing to the transfer of our venerable brother Michael Thomas Rosensky to the Metropolitan Archdiocese of St. Louis. Consequently, since you, beloved son, in the exercise of your priestly responsibilities in the Archdiocese of Washington, have clearly distinguished yourself as someone with a spiritual life, practical experience, learning, a devotion to Mary, charity, and a very active pastoral ministry, you present yourself to us as suitable as one to whom we may entrust this ministry of greater importance. Therefore, upon consultation with the Congregation for Bishops, from the fullness of our apostolic authority, we appoint you Bishop of the Diocese of Springfield in Massachusetts. You may receive Episcopal ordination from any Catholic bishop anywhere outside the city of Rome, the liturgical norms being observed. However, prior to this, as established by ecclesiastical law, you must duly make the profession of faith and take the oath of fidelity toward us and our successors in this see. Finally, it is our earnest desire that you fulfill your Episcopal service under the protection of the Blessed Virgin Mary, who in the most trustworthy helper is the most trustworthy helper and conciliator before her only begotten Son, as well as the glory and adornment of Holy Church. Given at Rome, at the Lateran, on the 14th day of the month of October, in the year of the Lord 2020, the eighth of our pontificate. And it is signed, Francis. My dear brothers and sisters in the Lord, good afternoon to all. I'm so glad to see that here in Springfield, all of the consultors have taken the Eleanor Woods uh, Latin speed reading course. And uh, first of all, I wish to express my congratulations to Bishop-elect Bill Byrne and his family 
We're all delighted that Mrs. Mary Byrne is with us and Sister Didi, who is helping out at the Centro Católico, where I spent many happy years in Washington, and many other members of Father Bill's clan are here with us today. We're also grateful for the presence of Archbishop Christophe Pierre, the Holy Father's personal representative and nuncio in Washington. Archbishop, please communicate our affection and, and gratitude to Pope Francis. We also want to express our congratulations to our newest American Cardinal, His Eminence Cardinal Wilton Gregory, Archbishop of Washington. I'm very honored to have been invited to have this ordination. Like Bishop-elect Byrne, I have great fondness for the Church of Washington, where I served for 20 years under three great archbishops, Cardinal O'Boyle, Cardinal Baum, and Cardinal Hickey, who was one of my co-consecrators when I was ordained Bishop of Washington's lone su suffragan see. Cardinal Hickey was the same great prelate who ordained Father William Byrne 26 years ago to the priesthood of Jesus Christ. On a fateful day in May 1984, then Archbishop Hickey called me to his house at 10 o'clock at night to tell me that Pope John Paul II named me Bishop of the Virgin Islands. He instructed me to go and see the nuncio the next morning to tell him whether I would accept the post. As I drove to the nunciature on Massachusetts Avenue, I realized that we were experiencing a total eclipse of the sun. I knew that had to be a sign, but for the life of me, I didn't know how to interpret it. So I submitted to the will of the Holy Father and our Superior General, who had already given his plotchet. Today, I fear an eclipse of the sun would have been a showstopper, but to borrow from the words of St. John of the Cross, entreme donde no supe, I entered in whither I knew not. Archbishop Pierre tells us that many priests have turned down an Episcopal appointment, sometimes because of humility, more often because of common sense or a desire for self-preservation and a less stressful existence. Bill, we are very grateful to you for saying yes to the call. We all know how happy you were as pastor of Our Lady of Mercy in Potomac, Maryland. Our hope is that you will be very happy here in Springfield in the Bay State, and that your ministry will bring much joy and be a great blessing for the faithful of this local church, which welcomes you today, filled with a desire to work with you to make Christ's kingdom more present in our world, proclaiming together the joy of the gospel with the wonderful Catholics of Springfield. Christ founded the church on the apostles, the first bishops. Mostly, they were simple fishermen, ill-prepared for the task that Jesus gave them. But they became vessels of clay bearing treasures who would carry the good news of the gospel to the ends of the earth, witnessing the truth of the gospel by shedding their blood. All of us are acquainted with da Vinci's portrait of the Last Supper. Today's gospel gives us St. Luke's portrait of the Last Breakfast. Our fickless fish fishermen apostles had toiled the whole night and caught nothing. But now the risen Lord has arrived and everything changes for the better. Peter hastened to put on all his clothes and then jumped into the water because the beloved disciple had declared, it is the Lord. When Peter reached the shore, he found Jesus cooking. This is the only instance in the scriptures that hints at Jesus' culinary prowess. Obviously, the Blessed Mother gave Jesus a few tips in the kitchen. Certainly, Jesus had learned from his mother that the fresher the fish, the better. In Fall River, a Portuguese housewife will routinely ask the fishmonger, what time was the fish caught? The first thing Jesus says to Peter is, bring me some of the fish that you've just caught. 
Peter throws himself back into the sea and swims towards the boat. He then drags the net to land with 153 fish, and still the net did not break. Scholars have produced many volumes speculating on the mystical meaning of the number 153. Some have related it to numbers to various parts of the Torah. St. Augustine, on the other hand, surmise that 153 is the triangular of 17. That means if you add up all the numbers decreasing from 17, you'll reach 153. 17 plus 16 plus 14, etc., equals 153. But you know what I think it means? Not to gainsay St. Augustine. I think it means that there were 153 fish in the net. My dad was a great angler, and when he returned from a fishing expedition, he could always tell you how many fish he caught, at what time, and how much each one weighed. I often joke that Peter was a lousy fisherman and that he never caught anything unless Jesus was right there telling him, cast the net here, now. But actually, Peter was a real fisherman and would have kept track of how many fish he caught. At the beginning of the Gospels, after the first miraculous draft of fishes, Peter says to Jesus, depart from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. Jesus did not depart, but instead calls Peter to be a fisher of men. Approximately three years later, at the end of the Gospel comes today's story. It's deja vu all over again. Another miraculous draft of fishes and St. Peter's profound sense of unworthiness. Yet, just as at the beginning of the Gospel, Jesus invites Peter again, saying, follow me. Spiritual writers like John of the Cross often speak of the second calling, which is a profound grace and deepening of our own personal conversion. Our response to the first call can often be romantic, self-seeking, and shallow. The response to a second call is often characterized by purification, greater humility, and a greater dependence upon God's grace. Today's gospel is definitely Peter's second call. If the first time Jesus called Peter, he felt unworthy, imagine how Peter felt having denied that he even knew Jesus. And what is worse is that Peter denied knowing Jesus, not to a soldier with a long knife, but to a waitress with an attitude. That bonfire by the shore of the Sea of Galilee is a reminder of the bonfire in the court of the high priest, where Peter denies the Lord hears the cock crow, and where Jesus turns and looks at Peter in the face. The Gospel records that Peter went out and wept bitterly. The sight of the Master's face bathed in blood melted Peter's heart. Peter had been doing at that point what all of us try to do at some point in our life, and that is Peter was trying to follow Jesus at a safe distance. But he discovered that that is not possible. The invitation to follow is an invitation to follow up close, to embrace the cross. At the last breakfast, Peter is standing before the risen Lord. Imagine, Peter is soaking wet, having jumped into the sea to swim ashore, and then again when Jesus sent him back to the boat, Peter was wet, cold, tired, but mostly he was ashamed of the three times that he denied Jesus. Jesus gives him the opportunity to erase those denials, asking Peter three times, do you love me? John of the Cross, whose feast day it is today, says that at the end of our life, we will all be examined in one thing, in love. 
That's what really matters in today's gospel. Peter is being examined in love. Today, William will be examined in a number of questions about his ministry. But basically, the church is just asking him to love. At Caesarea Philippi, Philip ma Peter makes his profession of faith. But at the Sea of Tiberias, Peter makes his profession of love. The triple denial of Jesus by Peter damaged the close relationship that Peter had with his master. Peter was then absent from some of the most significant events of the gospel. The royal lifting up of Christ on the cross, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. The foundation of Jesus' new family of God, behold thy mother, behold thy son, and the gift of the Spirit, emisit spiritum. All of these events have been marked by the presence of the beloved disciple and the absence of Peter. The denials must be overcome, and in the rhythmic repetition of the question, do you love me? There's a hint of an accusation. You once denied me. Are you sure of your relationship now? Peter is embarrassed. But his honest response led to Christ's acceptance of Peter's confession of love and the establishment of a new relationship. Peter is charged to shepherd and feed Jesus' flock. Peter's identification with the Good Shepherd must prepare him to make his own the words of Jesus. I have come that they may have life and have it more abundantly. And I lay down my life for my sheep. Peter's love for the Lord must manifest itself in the way that he loves Christ's flock, the church. His profession of love is followed by a solemn prediction about Peter's future lying down, laying down his life for the flock. Peter's commitment to the way of the Good Shepherd also associates him with the meaning of Christ's death. For Peter's unconditional acceptance of his role as shepherd of the sheep of Jesus will also lead to the glorification of God in his self-gift in love unto death, when a rope will be tied around him and he will be led where he would rather not go. After examining Peter in love and charging him to feed the flock and lay down his life, then Jesus invites Peter once again with the words that echo through the history of the church. Follow me. The invitation is to follow Jesus, not as Peter did when he fled from Gethsemane and tried to follow at a safe distance. But now Jesus invites Peter to follow up close in unswerving discipleship all the rest of his days. Jesus is teaching us that all ministry is about love, about laying down one's life for the flock, and that ministry is born of a deep friendship with the risen Lord. Peter and the apostles lived out their vocation, feeding Christ's flock and confirming the faith, making the Good Shepherd's love present to God's people. The gifts of ministry do not end with the apostles, but have been passed on by the laying on of hands and the gifts of the Spirit. Today, in our presence, Father Bill Byrne will receive the same ordination and share in the Apostle's role. Jesus is calling this man to follow him and to be a shepherd after his own heart. By this sacrament of power and love, the Good Shepherd and the gifts of the Spirit are made available to believers of every age. Without bishops, in the lineage of the apostles, there would be no priests, no magisterium, no power to forgive sins, and no possibility of Eucharist. This is why the church sees the ordination of bishops as the key to our identity as Catholics. In the way that Christ's loving plan is continued throughout history, our bishops are ordained by bishops to fulfill the mission Christ has given, to teach, to sanctify, to lead. Father Bill, you will be ordained a bishop 
in the apostolic succession by the same laying on of hands that ordained that cloud of witnesses, Matthias and Timothy, John Chrysostom, Patrick, Augustine, Boniface, John Fisher, John Carroll, Oliver Plunkett, John Newman, Fulton Sheen, James Walsh, Oscar Romero, Fran Francois Antoine, Bishops in the apostolic succession called to be one in the College of Bishops in union with Peter, to proclaim the Catholic faith with one voice, to be witnesses of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and to be spiritual fathers and shepherds. Bishop William, whenever you look back on this day, recall the charge of Paul to Timothy. I remind you to stir into flame the gift of God that you have received through the imposition of hands. For God did not give us a spirit of cowardice, but rather of power and love and self-control. Bear your share of the hardships of the gospel with the strength that comes from God. And remember always that your ministry is above all a call to follow Christ. You responded generously 26 years ago by embracing a vocation to the priesthood. Today is a second call. Like Peter, you are being called to a deeper conversion, to a vocation of love and service. We commend your ministry, the loving care of Mary, the mother of the divine shepherd, and through her intercession and the grace of this ordination, may God grant you a heart according to the heart of Christ, who came not to be served, but to serve and to lay down his life for the flock. The ancient rule of the Holy Fathers ordains that a bishop-elect is to be questioned in the presence of the people on his resolve to uphold the faith and to discharge his duty. And so, dear brother, do you resolve by the grace of the Holy Spirit to discharge until death the office entrusted us by the apostles, which we are about to pass on to you by the laying on of our hands. Do you resolve to preach the gospel of Christ with constancy and fidelity? I do. Do you resolve to guard the deposit of faith entire and incorrupt as handed down by the apostles and preserved in the church everywhere and at all times? I do. Do you resolve to build up the body of Christ, his church, and to remain in the unity of that body together with the order of bishops under the authority of the successor of St. Peter the Apostle. I do. Do you resolve to render obedience faithfully to the successor of the blessed Apostle Peter? I do. Do you resolve to guide the holy people of God in the way of salvation as a devoted father and sustain them with the help of your fellow ministers, the priests and deacons? I do. Do you resolve for the sake of the Lord's name to be welcoming and merciful to the poor, to strangers, and to all who are in need. I do. Do you resolve as a good shepherd to seek out the sheep who stray and gather them into the Lord's fold? I do. Do you resolve to pray without ceasing to Almighty God for the holy people and to carry out the office of high priest without reproach? I do, with the help of God. May God, who has begun the good work in you, bring it to fulfillment. Dearly beloved, let us pray 
that the kindness of Almighty God in providing for the welfare of the Church will grant an abundance of His grace for this chosen one.
God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, Father of mercies and God of all consolation, who dwells on high and look upon the lowly, who know all things before they come to be, and who laid down observances in your church through the word of your grace, who is from the beginning for ordained a nation of the just, born of Abraham, who established rulers and priests and did not leave your sanctuary without ministers, and who from the foundation of the world were pleased to be glorified in those you have chosen. Pour out now upon this chosen one that power which is from you, the governing spirit, whom you gave to your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, the spirit whom he bestowed upon the holy apostles, who established the church in each place as your sanctuary for the glory and unceasing praise of your name. Grant, O Father, knower of all hearts, that this, your servant, whom you have chosen for the office of bishop, may shepherd your holy flock, serving you day and night, May he fulfill before you without reproach the ministry of the high priesthood, so that always gaining your favor, he may offer up the gifts of your holy church. Granted by the power of the spirit of the high priesthood, he may have the power to forgive sins according to your command, assign offices according to your decree, and loose every bond according to the power given by you to the apostles. May he please you by his meekness and purity of heart, presenting a fragrant offering to you through your Son, Jesus Christ, 
through whom glory and power and honor are yours, with the Holy Spirit, in the Holy Church, now and forever and ever. May God, who has made you a share of the high priesthood of Christ, himself pour out upon you the oil of mystical anointing and make you fruitful with an abundance of spiritual blessings. Receive the gospel and preach the word of God with all patience and sound teaching. Receive this ring, the seal of fidelity, adorned with undefiled faith, Preserve unblemished the Bride of God, the Holy Church. Receive the mitre, and may the splendor of holiness shine forth in you, so that when the Good Shepherd appears, you may deserve to receive from him an unfading crown of glory. Receive the crozier, the sign of your pastoral office, and keep watch over the whole flock in which the Holy Spirit has placed you as bishop to govern the church of God.
pray, brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. We offer you the sacrifice of praise, O Lord, for the deepening of our service of you, so that what you have conferred on us, unworthy as we are, you may graciously bring to fulfillment through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Amen. Lift up your hearts. Lift up the Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation always and everywhere to give you thanks, Lord, Holy Father, almighty and eternal God. For by the anointing of the Holy Spirit, you made your only begotten Son, high priest of the new and eternal covenant. And by your wondrous design, we're pleased to decree that his one priesthood should continue in the church. For Christ not only adorns with a royal priesthood the people he has made his own, but with a brother's kindness, he also chooses men to become shares in his sacred ministry through the laying on of hands. They are to renew in his name the sacrifice of human redemption, to set before your children the Paschal banquet, to lead your holy people in charity, to nourish them with the word and strengthen them with the sacraments as they give up their lives for you and for the salvation of their brothers and sisters they strive to be conformed to the image of Christ himself and offer you a constant witness of faith and love. And so with all the angels and saints, we too give you thanks in exultation as we acclaim. Therefore, Lord, we pray, graciously accept this oblation of our service, that of your whole family, which we make to you, also for me, your unworthy servant, whom you have been pleased to raise to the order of bishops. And in your mercy, keep safe your gifts in me, so that what I have received by divine commission, I may fulfill through by divine assistance through Christ our Lord. Completing within us, O Lord, we pray, the healing work of your mercy and graciously perfect and sustain us so that in all things we may please you through Christ our Lord. That's the wrong prayer, sorry. <laughs> it's a little more confusing than it is on a regular Sunday at Mercy. <laughs> Therefore, Lord, we pray, graciously accept the oblation of our service. Be pleased, O God, we pray, to bless my... Go back. Just start at the beginning. Okay, we're going to start all over, okay? <laughs> Therefore, Lord, we pray, graciously accept this oblation of our service. Is that right here? Aha. The Lord be with you. <laughs> We've done that. May we lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. To you there, most merciful Father, we make humble prayer and petition through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, that you accept and bless these gifts, these offerings, this holy and unblemished sacrifice, which we offer you firstly for your holy Catholic Church. Be pleased to grant her peace, to guard, unite, and govern her throughout the whole world, together with your servant, uh, Francis, our Pope, and me, your unworthy servant, and all those who, holding to the truth, hand on the Catholic and apostolic faith. Remember, Lord, your servants and all gathered here, whose faith and devotion are known to you. For them we offer you the sacrifice of praise, or they offer it for themselves, 
and for all who are dear to them, for the redemption of their souls in hope of health and well-being and paying their homage to you, the eternal God, living and true. In communion with those whose memory we venerate, especially the glorious ever-Virgin Mary, Mother of our God and Lord Jesus Christ, and blessed Joseph, her spouse, your blessed apostles and martyrs, Peter and Paul, Andrew, James, John, Thomas, James, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Simon and Jude, Linus, Cletus, Clement, Sixtus, Cornelius, Cyprian, Lawrence, Chrysogonus, John and Paul, Cosmas, Damian, and all your saints. We ask that through their merits and prayers, in all things we may be defended by your protecting help. Therefore, O oh Lord, we pray, graciously accept this oblation of our service, that of your whole family. Order our days in your peace and command that you be delivered from eternal damnation and counted among the flock of those you have chosen. Therefore, Lord, we pray, graciously accept this oblation of our service, that, our, that of your whole family, which we make to you, also for me, your unworthy servant, whom you have been pleased to raise to the order of bishops, and in your mercy keep safe your gifts in me, so that I, what I have received by divine commission I may, be I may fulfill by divine assistance. Be pleased, O Lord, we pray, to bless, acknowledge, and approve this offering in every respect. Make it spiritual and acceptable, so that it may become for us the body and blood of your most beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. On the day before he was to suffer, he took bread in his holy and venerable hands, and with eyes raised to he heaven, to you, O God, his almighty Father. Giving you thanks, he said the blessing, broke the bread and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took this precious chalice in his holy and venerable hands. And once more giving you thanks, he said the blessing and gave the chalice to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it. For this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. The mystery of faith. Save us, Savior, from the world of your cross and resurrection. You have set us free. Therefore, O oh Lord, as we celebrate the memorial of the blessed Passion, the resurrection from the dead, and the glorious ascension into heaven of Christ your Son and our Lord, we, your servants and your holy people, offer to your glorious majesty from the gifts that you have given us, this pure victim, this holy victim, this spotless victim, the holy bread of eternal life and the chalice of everlasting salvation. Be pleased to look upon these offerings with a serene and kindly countenance and to accept them as one you are pleased to accept the gifts of your servant Abel the just, the sacrifice of Abraham, our father in faith, and the offering of your high priest, Melchizedek, O holy sacrifice, a spotless victim. In humble prayer, we ask you, almighty God, command that these gifts be borne by the hands of your holy angels to your altar in, on high in the sight of your divine majesty, so that all of us who through this participation at the altar receive the most holy body and blood of your son may be filled with every grace and heavenly blessing. Remember also, Lord, your servants who have gone before us with the sign of faith and rest in the sleep of peace. Grant them, O Lord, we pray, and all who sleep in Christ, a place of refreshment, light, and peace. To us also, your servants, who those sinners 
hope in your abundant mercies. Graciously grant some share in the fellowship with your holy apostles and martyrs, with John the Baptist, Stephen, Matthias, Barnabas, Ignatius, Alexander, Marcellinus, Peter, Felicity, Perpetua, Agatha, Lucy, Agnes, Cecilia, Anastasia, and all your saints. Admit us, we beseech you, into their company, not weighing our merits, but granting us your pardon through Christ our Lord. Through whom you continue to make all these good things, O Lord. You sanctify them, fill them with life, bless them, and bestow them upon us. Through him and with him and in him, O God Almighty, Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. Savior's command informed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress, as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. With Let us offer each other a little wave of peace.
Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am.
Let us pray. Complete within us, O Lord, we pray, the healing work of your mercy, and graciously perfect and sustain us so that in all things we may please you through Christ our Lord. Amen. Would you briefly be seated for one moment? I have a, first a confession to make for my stumble on the Eucharistic prayer. It was not just the fault of the composers of the books. As you will find out, I'm generally a Eucharistic prayer to default guy in my parish life, and so I'm going to have to get used to where things fit, actually, in that. And so it was on October 14th that I was announced that I was going to be the 10th Bishop of Springfield, of the Diocese of Springfield in Massachusetts. The very next day, my book, Five Things with Father Bill, from Father Bill, Hope, Humor, and Help for the Soul, was released by Loyola Press. But on the day of my Episcopal ordination, I would think it would be shame shameless to take this opportunity to promote my book. <laughs> but I will phrase things just out of habit on five things I am grateful for in this process and on this day. Number one, God. I'm grateful to God. And by uh, extension, the Holy Father, Pope Francis, has personal representative, our nuncio, Christophe Pierre, and the Metropolitan Archbishop, uh, Cardinal O'Malley. I was on a retreat, led this in preparation for this day, and Archbishop Hebner, who sadly could not join us today, directed me by Zoom. I was at friend's house uh, on Martha's Vineyard, and I set up one of the, like a little office space as a chapel, and the very first day, uh, Archbishop Hebner said to me, he said, I want you to realize that God is sending you not just because of different gifts that you have, he's sending you to Western Massachusetts because he loves you and he loves Western Massachusetts. So pray on that today. So I said, as I was sitting before our Lord in the Blessed Sacrament, I said, Lord, show me in a new way how much you love me, how much you love Massachusetts. And my hosts have a wall right near in this space where there was family photos and quotes and things. And as I prayed that, I looked to my left and there on the wall was a quote. And the quote said, do I love you? If, you, my, if your love is a grain of sand, mine is a universe of beaches. And I burst out laughing, not just because it was the answer to my prayer, but it's also a quote from the Princess Bride. <laughs> His love for Western Massachusetts and for me is infinitely greater than even a universe of beaches. I'm grateful to our loving God that he sent his only son into the world to find us and to save us, for giving us his mother as a model and guide and for forming us into his people in the church. And so it is, I thank Pope Francis for calling me to this, to accompany others, and especially the poor, and to the nuncio for being his emissary, his missionary, his shepherd to shepherds, and for God for calling me to the priesthood. I love being a priest. Number two, I'm thankful for his mom and dad. Mom's here, praise God. Dad is, i convinced, in the owner's box right now, <laughs> watching this along with his older brother, Father John Byrne. And but Mom, I'm grateful that on October 11th, 1964, you and Dad took me to get uh, baptized. You'd run out of other options, and so my godparents were my older sister, Sue, who read tonight, and my brother, Tom. I'm sure they didn't even know where they were going when they got in the car. But your faithful and joyful uh, Catholicism has been an inspiration. I'm grateful to my brothers and sisters for being here. Number three, I'm grateful for my brother priests. First of all, I'm grateful for number eight, Bishop McDonald. I'm grateful for number nine, uh, Archbishop Rosansky. I'm grateful for nine and a half <laughs> for, uh, of Bishop McManus. And on this day, I would say after my joy, my mother's joy, Bishop McManus is number three in the most <laughs> joyful people, not having to run two dioceses. To Cardinal O'Malley for your, your guidance, to my ordinaries, 
to Cardinal Wuerl, who taught me so much, with whom I worked and collaborated, and to Cardinal Gregory, and uh, Cardinal Dolan, when I was first discerning priesthood, the vocations director, now Bishop Mark Brennan, said, you need to get a spiritual director. So after a bit of inquiry, for three years I met with Father Tim Dolan when he was working at the Nunciature. It was already an image of the greatness to which he was going to achieve later in his ecclesiastical career. And also I'm grateful for Cardinal O'Brien, who was my rector, and I know he's watching now. He couldn't make it because he's in Rome. But to all the bishops who made the efforts, especially Bishop Cecchio and Bishop Vetter, my, my buddies that I ran with in the seminary, and now I don't have to serve every Mass with them. <laughs> to my chaplains, Monsignor Panky and, uh, and for Father Griffin, to my parochial vicars are, who are here that I've had. I have a great honor that I take pride in. I'm friends with every guy who was assigned to me as a parochial vicar. Doesn't really always happen that way. And also the vocations, so the many guys, uh, I think we're at 14 guys now who were um, seminarians, no, were students at the University of Maryland when I was chaplain, and are now priest of the archdiocese, priest of the order of preachers. Uh, it's uh, great to have you here with me. Um, and my mercy seminarians, these guys right here, where's the other one? They are not just seminarians for the archdiocese of Washington. There are five seminarians from my former parish. God has not caught calling men. I think we have. That's one parish, five awesome guys. Every single one of these guys. <laughs> They're all great. Number four that I'm grateful for are the friends and the people of the Archdiocese of Washington. In all my assignments from Little Flower to St. Jude's, the Catholic Student Center at the University of Maryland, St. Peter's on Capitol Hill, to Our Lady of Mercy, who the people generously gave me my beautiful crozier, and to the school which gave me the pectoral cross, to my family who gave me this beautiful ring. But for all the lay collaborators in ministry at every level, my friends at each stage of my life, I want to thank you for teaching me how to be a priest. It is the people that forms in love great pastors. And if we can stop and listen to them, we can learn a lot. Number five, last but not least, I'm grateful to the priests and religious and the lay people of Western Massachusetts who have welcomed Zelly and myself so warmly. I think Zelly has been more warmly welcomed than me, but Zelly is my dog for those of you who don't know, by the diocesan staff who have really treated her with great spoiled love, uh, and to the, all the effort of the planning committee that went into this, to Stacy Dibburn, to Father Bill Hamilton, Monsignor Christopher Conley, Deacon Leo Coughlin, uh, Louise uh, Sinico McDonald, Annette Plord, Sister Eileen, who made this place look so beautiful, Deacon Pedro Rivera Moran, Monsignor Dan Liston, Mark DuPont, and Carly McGrath. Thank you for all the effort that you put into this. And to WWLP Channel 22, who have donated so generously time to EWTN and Catholic uh, TV in Boston for generously broadcasting this presentation. To the priests, religious, and deacons, I have had a chance to meet many of you and received emails and chatted on the phone with you. You and I are more than neighbors. We are brothers and sisters in the mission to save souls. When I was at St. Peter's, we started with 750 families, and when I left, we had 1,500 families. It's not hubris, but I really believe that God has not given up. We must rebuild trust, and we must preach the joy that love conquers hate, that peace defeats violence, that love, life destroys death itself, that Jesus Christ is risen, and in this alone do we find hope. And finally, to my brothers and sisters in Western Massachusetts. I went to college just east of here. Spent a lot of time in Boston, and Cardinal Sean and Bishop McManus will forgive me. I think people are a lot nicer the farther you move west in Massachusetts. <laughs> And it's not just because we have great police, but I think it's just that 
It's something I've observed, no comment. Um, and I thank you for the welcome and prayers. This week I met with survivors of clergy sexual abuse. Their courage and their honesty is heroic. To those now, to all who have been abused, I offer my deepest apologies. But words mean nothing without actions. The survey that was taken in this diocese has spoken loudly since my arrival here on Elliott Street. Transparency and communication are demanded of us, and this will be my priority. Así que ora a mis vecinos y de su hermano William, les digo de nuevo que Dios no ha terminado con el oeste de Massachusetts. Tenemos muchos trabajos que hacer. Mis pulpito está aquí. Mis hermanos sacerdotes los alimentan desde los altares de nuestras parroquias. Pero ustedes han de alimentar espiritualmente a sus hermanos y hermanas en sus mesas de la cena, las salas de reuniones, las salas de descanso, los comedores, las aulas. Y literalmente debemos alimentar físicamente y cuidar a los pobres. Este día y en adelante, Unan, unanse a mí para traer a sus, a sus hermanos, hermanas, vecinos y amigos de regreso a Jesucristo, quien solo trae alegría al mundo. And so to my brothers and sisters, from your brother William, your newest brother William, I say again, God has not done with Western Massachusetts. We have a lot of work to do. My pulpit's here, my brothers feed you from the altar in their parishes, but you are to spiritually feed your brothers and sisters at your dinner tables, at your boardrooms, your break rooms, your lunch rooms, your classrooms, and literally we must physically feed and care for the poor. This day and beyond, join me in bringing your brothers and sisters and neighbors and friends back to Jesus Christ, who alone brings joy to the world. For these things, these five things, I am most grateful. Praise be Jesus Christ. Thank you. The Lord be with you. With your spirit. Somebody say bow down for the blessing. Bow down for the blessing. O oh God, who care for your people with great gentleness and rule them in love, endow with the spirit of wisdom those to whom you have handed on authority to govern, that from the flourishing of a holy flock may come eternal joy for its shepherds. Amen. In your majestic power, you allot the numbers of our days and the measure of our years. Look favorably on our service and confer on our time the abundance of your peace. Amen. Amen. Give happy outcome to the tasks that through your grace have been laid upon me, whom you have raised to the rank of bishop. Make me pleasing in the fulfillment of my duties and so guide the hearts of people and pastor, that the obedience of the flock may never fail, fail the shepherd, nor the care of the shepherd be lacking for, for the flock. And may Almighty God bless all who are gathered here, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.
Thank you. 